today we have a very special guest, Tom Bassel, and we're going to talk a lot about backtesting, which is a topic that we have not covered too often on this show, and I think that you all will have a lot to learn from it. Tom, thank you for joining us. Welcome. Hey, it's my pleasure. Our, our pleasure to have you here. We're, we're honored that you would, you would take time to join us. Um, so let's, uh, let's get started here. Um, you know, maybe you can take a moment and just introduce yourself, and then we'll, uh, we'll start talking about the markets. Well, I've <clears throat> been a trader for, I guess, I, I, started, I bought my first mutual fund when I was 12 years old and a paper boy. So uh, I go back a long time. I'm coming up uh, on 68 this next week. Uh, so it's been a lot of decades of trading uh, various ways. Uh, at first, it was buy and hold the mutual funds. Eventually, it, as I became a chemical engineer, I got interested in the chemical stocks to try to pick where I was going to go to work and uh, got quickly bored with chemical engineering because after you design one heat exchanger, the next one's about the same. There's not a whole lot of variety to it. And uh, the mental challenges were less than exciting. And at the same time, I became enthralled with the, what I call the brain tease of the financial markets. It just is, it's a type of thing where you, just like golf, you'll never have a perfect round of golf. You'll never ever be a perfect trader. You, always, you only can aspire to get better at it and, uh, and kind of puzzle over what it is that you have to do next to get better. And uh, that's, that was a very intriguing thing because I figured I could brain tease myself for the rest of my life, which has certainly been the case. And uh, one thing led to another, as I was trading my own portfolio, I got more and more successful, met some other people that were successful, ended up uh, starting Kennedy Capital back in the old days in St. Louis, and it was largely a small cap stock firm. Okay. And then uh, we kind of, I, I kind of got more interested in futures because small stocks, I think, you know, get into a big bear market, you could be down 50 to 80%. It's not a great business model to try to just be a one directional stock trader in, in a volatile environment. And uh, so I thought, you know, let's diversify and have a futures program too. And one of my partners really, really hated futures. The other one was sort of ambivalent and didn't really understand anything about it. And I came up the learning curve very fast. And so I went ahead and sold my shares of that, did Trendstat Capital, which is what I'm known for and where I was when I was managing 600 million and currency trading and all that stuff. And I guess futures and currencies took over and got a lot more of the, the chunk of the effort and the money. And that's probably what people most know me as nowadays. But then I retired like 17 years ago, 2003, okay. at about 51 years old. So I've been retired a long time and I still kept in touch with the industry. A lot of people uh, asking me trading questions, interviewing me. Uh, I'm Because I'm retired, I do have some time to be able to do interviews and things, talks. Mm -hmm. So what ended up happening uh, to just cut down on some of the email traffic we, we created Enjoy the ride world. Uh, I call it my retirement website. It basically takes everything, all my knowledge of trading and tries to collect it together in one place. So people can 24 hours a day, seven days a week, go to it and read research papers that I've done and how I do my hedging and, you know, get recommended reading lists and links to things like Trendspider and you know, that type of thing. So it's, they don't need to contact me. So it saves me a lot of time. It makes sense. Um, so that's kind of my whole life in a, in a, a three minute, uh, four minute uh, dissertation. It's a fascinating story. Um, I'm, I'm curious at, uh, at, at your fund, uh, did you engage in position trading or were you guys intraday? What, what style of trading did you guys um, engage the, uh, in? In that Trendstat, I'd, I'd say, was completely once a day. Uh, okay. We had a 24-hour cycle where we bring in data. Some of it was being brought in tick by tick and stored ourselves. Others was brought in from outside data vendors. A lot of data checking went on to check accuracy of the data, make sure all the data sources uh, agreed with each other. And then we'd run it through the processes. And we ran... 80 different markets at the peak, uh, 30 different currency pairs, 25 different mutual funds, commodity options. I think we had about 16 commodity options we traded. Um, 
and there was a lot going on. I mean, the, the, the runs on the old PCs before all this high speed stuff that we use today, it would take a good 15, 20 minutes to go through hundreds of different accounts, like 14 different trading desks that we had to deal with. Um, there was a lot of data coming in and a lot of data going out. And uh, once a day, all these different strategies would be lined up and we'd have to, to comply with law. If you're managing pension assets, you have to actually offset your buy and sell orders if it's in the same instrument so that you don't just in uh, just trade for the sake of trading and generate commissions or something. So uh, you have to go through processes where you take all your strategies and you have to get rid of the ones that are countering each other one and, and crossing each other out kind of sp- and then get the net, uh, you know, order that you want to send in. And it got complicated, <laughs> a lot of programming. We figured when somebody asked me, what did it cost me to build the software that ran Trendstat? I did uh, put the pencil on the paper and I just estimated people's salaries, how many years they've been with me and stuff. I figured about a million dollars it cost to build that thing. It, it was a lot of code. Sounds about right. Building software is expensive. Is that is. Um, is your experience at, uh, at 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 that firm what led you to you know backtest and did you guys build a backtest or what what kind of tools did you guys use? The way we did it is we built a platform to backtest and then we turned the a single day of backtesting into the generation of orders. So in other words we'd make believe in the back tester that we are going to ship out orders at the end of that particular day's worth of data. And at that point, it would go through just like you were running the orders for the day. The only difference is, is at the end, instead of actually sending the orders, it would just store them into a database for that day and then loop back to the next day and start all over again. So we were truly running our back tester precisely the way we traded every day. That was some heavy duty programming to get it to that level. Absolutely. Um, uh, is that, um, w- would you say that uh, uh, a lot of traders would benefit from backtesting? Because not uh, a lot of traders actually do it, right? As far as I know, most traders are very, um, you know. Yeah, I, I don't understand that because uh, it seems to me that, the best part of backtesting is not the number that comes out. Everybody wants to say, oh, I did 23% or 28% or whatever the number is, 56%. That, that's on history. That's on a, a database of very specific days and different markets and events that occurred in the world that moved the markets around. That database that you just ran it against is not going to be precisely what happens in the future. There's going to be new news, new ups and downs, faster volatility than you've ever seen before, a la COVID just recently. You know, there's going to be situations that come up that set new records, new record volumes, new record instruments, new record volatility that you've never seen before. It's more uh, back testing allows you to understand the logic that you've applied to the data and how you want to buy and sell given that logic. And it it, it tells you, okay, if we go back to some year that was a a nice big positive year, I have a long only strategy, I should have made money that year. Did I make money that year in the back tester? By narrowing down and trying to figure out how your strategy is gonna react to different market conditions and then go back and look for those market conditions and see how your strategy reacted to it. How about 2008? If you have a long only program and you're in 2008, did you hit stop losses and go largely to cash or did you get chopped to death and take a big loss because Mm -hmm. you were so long oriented that you didn't have any protection to the downside? So that shows you some of your Achilles heels uh, in, in terms of your strategy. And I think it's very helpful psychologically when you start going into a drawdown, especially as a new trader, you haven't experienced uh, drawdowns at all, maybe. And if you've been just trading lately, you've had the wind at your back. It's been a wonderful time ever since we hit the bottom in COVID there around April or so. Absolutely. It'd be hard to screw this up. 
to make money, but but then you would be very very uh, blindsided when it went the other way, and you realize, oh, I, I'm losing money like crazy now. And I think that's what back testing really helps me with over time, and it helps me understand where are my weak spots with this specific strategy. And then what I do is I frankly, and you can use stuff like TrendSpider to help is to look at what I call the holes. The holes are your drawdowns. I've been through so many drawdowns in my lifetime, I've lost track. But what you do with strategy development is to say, well, why limit myself just to one long-term strategy? How about if I look at that one drawdown that I have in 2008 and develop a strategy that would have an easier time making money in 2008 to help offset what I'm losing over here on the other side. And at the same time, not lose a lot of money during the rest of the period when my first strategy was making a lot of money. And what you're doing is smoothing out the equity curve because you, you smooth your equity curve out. It, man, life is a whole lot easier as a trader. Mm-hmm. Jack Schwager tagged me as Mr. Serenity. I mean, it's hard to be serene in the trading world without having a smooth equity curve. If, is that why you always hedge your positions? And you, I know, I know you write a lot about hedging. Right. I, I'm a big believer in that because of the, the nature of, let, let's say you're trading some small cap stock or, you know, it doesn't have the liquidity to jump in and out of it very easily if you're moving a little bit of money. And what you can do is using like a SPY ETF or even an ES futures contract or a NASDAQ futures contract if you trade tech stocks, there's lots of different indices out there that you can use. By taking a position to the short side in that type of thing, it's so easy to put that on and off because those instruments are so, so liquid. I mean, SPY, when we were tracking it, was we were bringing in, I think it was 35 trades a, per second. It's incredible. That, that was the data feed we had to deal with. And I'm, that was back in 2003. I wonder what it is today. I you mean, see, uh, it's unbelievable the amount of ticks that come through. So 400 per second. During yeah. The- I mean, so you got a little stop order in there for your little account that is nowhere near the size of the markets. You're just going to get taken out right on the tick mm-hmm. and it's um, highly efficient. Now you've got a position long in your stock portfolio and you got a position short and the two are fighting each other. You know, one's, one's making money this way and the other one's making money that way. And so when they're together, not much is happening. And your portfolio is basically uh, closer to zero. It's not perfectly zero, but it, you've knocked out a lot of market risk, which certainly allows me to sleep at night. And as a retired guy, I don't want to have in a down 50 to 80% stock market that could easily come along someday. I don't want to be sitting there watching my whole thing, you know, my basic, my retirement portfolio disappear. So. I don't blame you. I don't think anybody wants to be there, but many people uh, find themselves there all the time. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm curious, Tom, uh, you use TrendSpider's backtester a lot nowadays. Uh, what, what's, what's your favorite part of it? Uh, for that, how about I share my screen? Awesome. Let's take a look. What I like about the back testing and TrendSpider, it's, to me, it's largely a buy sell engine tester. And this is something that if anybody's followed my website, I talk about hedging a lot. And this is the uh, SPY, which I use for hedging, uh, Standard Poor's 500 to ETF. And I use three different indicators and I lean it towards the upside. Now, how do I do that? Real easily. On the downside signals, I'm doing 50 days of Bollinger Bands, Keltner Channels, and Donchins. Notice 50 is just the same in all of the cases. There's no optimization being done here. And 21 days, which is a, roughly a month worth of trading days, is where I uh, exit. And uh, because TrendSpider is an upside-oriented uh, um, tester, I do it the opposite. I actually buy when it breaks downward and I sell when it breaks upward and then I just put an inverse on my results. So pretty easy to do. And what I like about it is you can go back on lots and lots of data, 5,000 in this case, run it. And here you go, you know, you're all, you're down to 
an average loss of 40.43% on each hedge trade I do. And what I'm looking for, I have to, you have to think inversely uh, with what I'm doing here, but <clears throat> you've got uh, a 27% uh, minimum loss at showing in TrendSpider. Inverse it again. That's a positive trend, uh, hedge that I did that made me 28% against a very bad bear market that was in history somewhere in the last 5,000 pieces of data. And on average, it's costing me about 0.4% every time I do a hedge trade on average. That's the insurance I pay to protect my retirement portfolio. Hedging is not designed to make money. It's, it's designed to preserve my assets. So do you, roll, uh, do you roll your hedge options frequently? I don't use the options. I use the ETF itself. So okay. it has an actually, infinite actually, uh, yeah. okay. thing. And if I, you do you do use futures because I am a futures trader and I like using futures as well. Sometimes the tax advantages there are better. Uh, I actually just roll it once every quarter. Uh, you know, okay. so it'd be March, June, September, December, with say the S and P 500 or the uh, RTY, the Russell 2000. Those are very liquid, very easy to get in and out, and you're going to get uh, a fairly good hedge you know, for the general market. But what I like, I like is the distributions. And I like being able to see, all right, what was my, my maximum hedge winner? And what was my, this was the 7.4 would be my maximum hedge loser in this case, because you got to inverse it. And it gives, it gives a performance. It shows that there is a cost to hedging in my mind. And, and if you're doing a normal, um, you know, Apple stock or something, this would be a positive. But uh, in my case, it's a negative because I'm inverting it. Right. But I can easily show, you know, by the three indicators, I can see which one is in play first here. This right now is a time of this talk, uh, 305.69 on the ETF is where I have my stop. So I and, uh, for you, how did you land on using these three indicators together? Well, I tried to understand the math. Uh, if you go on investopedia.com, you see hundreds of different indicators, some of which I have no clue what they're doing. But I started reading uh, through indicators and I tried to look for ones that made the most sense to me mathematically. In other words, if I'm looking to trend follow the market on a once a day basis, what can I do to separate out noise, which is this area between the green lines on the top and the red lines on the bottom, that I want to ignore. As an engineer, that's kind of like a, a temperature control loop and the temperature's not changing that much, so you don't have to do anything. But now if the temperature goes up, maybe you need cooling to mm -hmm. come in. So you pour water into the heat exchanger to try to cool it off a little bit. If it's getting too cold down here, maybe you got to add steam and you got to heat the, the heat exchanger up. Kind of the same concept here in trading. You got noise. You got areas where you want to say that the market's in an uptrend and you got areas below the lines that's a, clearly a downtrend. So how do you ignore the noise? Well, I looked for indicators that had some ability to measure a changing condition. So in Bollinger Bands, it's measuring the standard deviation of the movement of the, uh, of the prices standard deviation changes, higher volatility, wider bands, lower volatility, tighter bands, perfect. Keltner, they use ATR or average true range as a measurement of volatility. High volatility is a higher AT ATR, therefore wider bands. Mm -hmm. uh, lower volatility, lower ATR, lower uh, 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 skinnier bands, less noise. Uh, Donchin channels is the other one. Uh, Donchin's are based on the maximum high and the minimum low of the last X amount of days. The wider that range becomes in volatile times, the wider the Donchin channel will be. So, but each of them have their own Achilles heel a little bit. So by combining the three together, I feel like they're, uh, the, the, the other two are the crutches for the, the third one. You know, the, they can kind of hide and, and help each other out a little bit. Like right now you can see Dunchins as the stepwise thing. It's riding on the outside. But if we get into a real tight sideways, eventually those Dunchins will be right up there next to the prices. 
and may take over as the uh, the critical one. Right now, I think it, it's Bollinger Bands that is uh, uh, right now uh, the inside track. As right, right, the, it'll tell you. Uh, yeah, it's, it's Keltner, Keltner. Sorry. Um, so Keltner has been in there. Bollinger is getting really tight. And in a lot of my ETFs that I use a similar type of an approach on my ETF trading, I trade about 23 different ETFs. Uh, a lot of those, the Bollinger has actually taken over and uh, moved inside the Keltner and is setting the I, th I think they call that a uh, TTM squeeze, right? When the, the Bollinger and the Keltners invert their natural okay. positioning. Um, I wouldn't know that. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, there, there, there's a whole indicator about it that a lot of people swear by. They look for the squeeze um, as a sign of uh, consolidation and then, you know, break out from it. And it's called TCM? TTM. Oh, PPM, sorry. T is in okay. Tom, Tom, Mary. Oh, Tom, Tom, Mary. Got it. We yeah, have I, but there's point. so much, I mean, the tabular data you guys give you, give the person and the ability to quickly, I mean, you saw how fast this went. You can trade. 5,000 candles or 5,000, you know, bars, basically daily data. And the results are coming back inside of seconds. And you can try to understand by changing parameters, how that's affecting you in the back testing. And this helps your psychological so much. And that's the most important part of trading with all due respect to trend spider and everybody else out there that worries about buy sell in engines. I did that one study where I flipped a coin and you know, as long as you get a trend in your favor and you go on the right side of it, you're going to end up making money as long as you position size well and more importantly, are disciplined and move your stops and do all the things that traders have to do that in many cases, boring stuff. But it's the mental side. I find so many traders just mess up. You know, they get overly excited, overly nervous, overly depressed, anxious every emotion in the book. And I think in the end, you've got to be able to, to stabilize yourself. Well, knowing your strategy so well that you know where it's going to have the good periods and where it's going to have the bad periods and where it's just going to hold its own and go sideways. When those periods come up, you've already been there in your back testing. You already say, okay, I'm expecting this. This isn't broken. This is not, I don't have to fix anything yet. Mm -hmm. This is, this is what the back testing showed me was going to happen. And it, it's happening in this type of market markets down. I'm down. Yeah. I, I should be expecting that. Absolutely. I think that really, really helps uh, the long-term uh, mental process. I would agree. And I think, um, I think back testing can give you the experience you need without the risk to be patient when you need to be patient. Tom, exactly. thank you for that. I think, um, I think a lot of people uh, uh, have, would have learned a lot from that. And, um, you know, I wish we had more time because, because I could honestly sit here and talk with you all day. I'm going to get yelled at if I let this go too much longer. <laughs> um, so uh, one, one last question for you. Sure. One of my favorite questions. Um, I, I, I love asking this, especially from people like you who have decades of experience. Um, what advice would you give a brand new trader who's just getting started today? Uh, I guess, First, I'd, I'd try to understand what a total trading strategy is because it's not just some moving average that gives you a buy and a sell. Uh, there are so many markets you could trade. There are so many uh, ways you could allocate that. So many strategies you could take to come up with buy and sells a la TrendSpider. Mm -hmm. You got so many different ways you could size your positions from capital based to volatility based to risk based to margin based combination of those. And then to really do some uh, work on yourself, uh, read some books on trading psychology. I, Mark Douglas in the old days before he passed away, had some good ones. Uh, Van Tharp has some interesting ones. Trade Your Way to Financial Freedom is still one of my favorite trading books of all time by Tharp. Uh, so there's lots out there. I would soak it all up. I would uh, look for like the Trend Spider webinars. You've got a lot of great guests on that talk about a lot of different topics. Uh, there's other webinars that are being held out there. Just try to soak it up and, and do some back testing before you get started. And then when you start, dial everything back as far as you can. I mean, trade 10 shares if you have to mm -hmm. 
of a stock or one contract of a futures and only trade five futures, don't trade 20. Just get started, understand what you're doing and, and limp along and then realize that you're probably going to take some time to be successful. It's, you're going to be a learning curve, just like you go to college and pay the tuition of college to get the degree. Well, to get the degree in trading, you might have to pay a few losses along the way and learn from them. So expect that and make sure that's dialed into your capital that you've allocated and the time you've allocated and everything. And then I think expect a long-term uh, process and always try to learn more. I'm still learning today. Absolutely. That's, that's great advice. Um, I, I like to say um, it's a, it's a 10,000 hour skill, right? You have to put the time in, you have to pay your tuition. Like you said. Yeah. Well, I've paid, I, I've paid a lot. <laughs> I, I have too, man. Let, let me talk, <laughs> especially when I was just getting started in 08, 08 was a crazy time to start. So I was like, okay, here you go. Tuition, tuition, tuition. <laughs> um, well, Tom, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure to have you on. Um, everybody, if you want to learn more about Tom, his website is enjoytheride.world. World is the TLD. Um, definitely check him out. We'll put a link to Tom's website and Twitter profile in the description below. Tom, thank you again for being here, and I hope you'll be on again one day. It's my pleasure, Dan. Have a great day. Bye-bye.